to the final week of our sermon series that we've been uh, living this fall, where we've asked the question, what is God really like? And so you may have noticed that um, we are doing this one a little bit differently. Uh, we have not touched on those qualities of God that we see in Christ. Uh, we have not talked about the loving nature of God or the forgiving nature of God or all those wonderful qualities that are brought out in the New Testament. Now, we have been in the book of Genesis. We have been rehearing and reliving some of those famous stories of God relating to people in the book of Genesis. And we've been teasing out some um, sort of different characteristics of God so that we can sort of fill up, right, fill up our image of God a little bit more. So I hope you've enjoyed this time in Genesis. I hope you've uh, learned a little something about uh, the book of Genesis and certainly something more about our Lord. If you recall the last few weeks, we have learned that God is creative, right? Because he made the world and everything in it. Uh, we've learned that God is dependable, that he will never let us down. Uh, we spent a week talking about the fact that God is flexible, uh, meaning that, uh, you know, no matter what choices we humans make, right, God can kind of roll with it, right, and, and still make his purposes known. And last week, we talked about one of my, one of my favorite characteristics of God, uh, that God is mysterious, right? We talked about that uh, fog that rolled into the temple and, and uh, demonstrated God's presence so many years ago, right? All those mysterious ways that God makes himself known to his people. Today, we're going to cap things off by learning that God is providential. Providential. Now, don't worry if you don't get that term immediately. I will define it as we go on this morning. Um, but this morning, uh, for one last time, when we ask what is God like, we're going to respond with the answer, God is providential. So Dave started us out this morning with the story of Joseph and his brothers. And I'm going to read a little bit more of that story from Genesis chapter 45. I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 8, and then I will skip forward in Joseph's story to chapter 50, verses 18 through 21. So let's listen now for the word of the Lord. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all of his attendants. And he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified in his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will not be plowing or reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler over all of Egypt. And now in chapter 50, we hear this conclusion to the story. 
Joseph's brothers then came and threw themselves down before Joseph. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and for your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. It's the word of the Lord. Won't you pray with me, please? Gracious God, we thank you for this Sunday morning in October when we can gather here around your word and we can worship you this day. Lord, we ask that you would just open up our minds and our hearts to these ancient words from the book of Genesis so that we can take them into our lives all in an effort to be closer to you. Lord, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as with any uh, new generation, right, younger generation, the younger generation that is around today, whether it's millennials or Gen Zers or even younger, um, they have some of their own terminologies, right? I noticed this in, in my own kids. And one such uh, term or word that, that I've noticed that's really in vogue lately that was not even around 10 years ago is the term influencer, okay? An influencer. I'm sure, you know, Hannah and Landon and you all know that term, right? The term, yeah, Landon does. The term influencer. Of course, we've always had the verb to influence, right? Which means uh, the ability to sway somebody to your uh, perspective, right? Or to do what you want them to do. But I'm not using it as a verb here. I'm using it as a noun. And sometimes it is used with a capital I, like a proper noun, as if to say, I am an influencer, okay? And nowadays, some folks can even say, I am a paid professional influencer, right? Not, not a job category when I was, you know, coming out of college, certainly. An influencer is defined as someone, of course, who can influence others. And today it is used for folks who are on social media so much that they can influence potential buyers of a product or service by recommending it to their many followers on social media. There are influencers on TikTok, on Instagram, on YouTube, and the like. Uh, one of the biggest influencers right now is a woman named Addison Ray. She got to be an influencer. I find this interesting, especially as somebody who I went through many years of education to get into my profession, right? But she got to be an influencer in 2019 by posting short videos of herself dancing on TikTok, okay? Like six years of seminary, you know, maybe I should have just, you know, posted videos of myself on TikTok, you know, maybe I should have. Her videos have become so popular among young people that she has 81 million followers on TikTok. Okay, she's the third most followed influencer on TikTok. Now that amount of followers, as you can imagine, got the attention of some corporations who approached her and asked her to peddle their products to her followers. So Addison endorses everything from American Eagle jeans, right, to L'Oreal Cosmetics. And hold on to your seats for a second, because <laughs> I'm going to tell you now that in 2020, Addison earned more than $5 million as an influencer, okay? More than $5 million. So influencers have quite an effect, right? But they can also have some truly positive effects on people uh, beyond just making money for themselves. Some influencers out there try to get folks to be healthier through diet and exercise, that sort of thing. Some influencers try to influence people to take political action or to become involved in a cause, like a nonprofit sort of thing. 
And this past summer, when the Biden administration wanted to increase the number of young people getting vaccinated for COVID-19, guess who they turned to, right? They wisely turned to the influencers. The White House realized that at that time in the summer, only 56% of young people were vaccinated. And so, and also there was, you know, a lot of that misinformation floating around, and so they turned to some influencers. They turned to singer Olivia Rodrigo. They turned to TikTok comedian Benny Drama, to TikTok activist Jax James, to TikTok personality Taylor Cassidy, and to YouTuber Coyote Peterson to influence young people to get the COVID-19 vaccine. Some were invited to the White House to make their videos. Some were invited to give speeches, and they were filmed giving speeches, and these videos and speeches were sent out to their millions of followers. The thinking was that if these influencers could get the young people to do a dance, right, or to buy some lipstick, well, maybe they could get them to become vaccinated, right? You understand the logic. It's a good strategy for young people, right? Influencers. They have a lot, hold a lot of sway in today's society. Well, today in the church, we're talking about the fact that the stories, the ancient, ancient stories from the book of Genesis show us that God is what I'm calling providential. Now, that's also a big word, and, and we don't use that word very much in, in common parlance. Uh, but by providential, I mean that there is a purposeful benevolence or purposeful good that orders the events of life. This, for us as Christians, means that God, we believe God, is directing the course of human drama but not necessarily by direct intervention. Now, I will say that if you're you know, paying attention to my line of reasoning, right, you can come up with some uh, counterexamples to what I'm saying. Uh, for instance, God does directly intervene in the lives of his people in the Old Testament. You might think of when he uh, saved his people from Egypt, right, and led them out of slavery and into the Promised Land. He spread the, the uh, waves, the waters of the Red Sea so that they could walk directly through, right? That would be a direct influence of God. But most of the time, okay, most of the time in history, certainly in our lives today, God is more like an influencer. Today we see uh, some snippets from the story of Joseph. You remember, Joseph is that favorite son of the patriarch Jacob. Uh, Joseph's story uh, goes from uh, chapter Genesis chapter 37 to Genesis chapter 50, and of course we couldn't read all of that, so between Dave and myself, we read three different snippets, right? Details of his life. A life that was full of intrigue and deceit, betrayal, and fortunately, in the end, forgiveness. Dave read the passage about, one of the passages, about Joseph's dreams. He was famous as a dreamer. And in that passage that Dave read, uh, he, he talked about uh, Joseph's tendency to really irritate his family through his dreams. Right? These dreams then became so annoying that it caused his brothers to want to get rid of Joseph. And so they did. And they, they stuffed him in a cistern, and they sold him off into slavery. The second reading, jumping ahead that I did from chapter 45, shows Joseph after he was sold into slavery. Joseph, had, on the way, had encountered many people, and he had impressed everyone who he met. So at one point, Joseph meets the pharaoh, right, the king, the head of Egypt, he interprets some dreams for the Pharaoh and, and impresses the Pharaoh terribly. And so the Pharaoh brings Joseph into his palace, right, into his household, and makes Joseph up there in power, right, almost equal to that of the Pharaoh. 
No one other than Pharaoh had more power in the land than Joseph. So then when a famine came into the area, a famine that Joseph had predicted by interpreting dreams, Joseph's brothers show up in Egypt asking for food. Joseph, at first he gives them food, but he doesn't reveal who he is. But then when they come back later for a second time asking for food, he does reveal himself. And that's the part that I read from chapter 45, when Joseph said this to his brothers. He said, I am Joseph, right? Reveal himself, I am Joseph. Do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. Pretty interesting way to look at, isn't it? I mean, Joseph sees his brothers after all of these years, and he could have been utterly furious and unforgiving with them. They treated him horribly. But instead, Joseph looks at it as if it was God sending him into Egypt for a greater purpose. Pretty good way to look at it. Then the final verses that I read from chapter 50, that little snippet at the end, shows a, a great reconciliation between Joseph and his brothers. The brothers bow down before Joseph in thanksgiving for saving their lives. And once again, we see Joseph giving the credit to God's providence by saying, You, brothers, you, intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Do not be afraid, I will provide for you and for your children. So God is giving the credit for this reconciliation, this happy ending to God and God alone. Throughout this long and twisted story of Joseph's life, we see divine providence at work. God's providence was at work despite the incredibly mean actions of Joseph's brothers and despite the very difficult circumstances of the family. The providence of God is a characteristic of our Lord that can be very, very assuring to us. Providence is, is the belief, again, that there is a, a, pro, a purposeful, sorry, purposeful benevolence or purposeful good ordering the events of life. Providence provides a conviction for us that God will provide. Whether it's for us as an as a individual, or for us as a family, or as a church, or as a community. This is based in our trust in God as our good creator. A God who will care for us and who will always guide us among life's twists and turns. Please understand, this is not a, a fatalism, right, or a determinism where we just throw up our hands and say, I can't do anything about it, right? God is in control, I'm just resigned in my life, I can't do a darn thing, right? It is not that. It is, it is a way to look for the merciful activity of God in all things. So friends, here's, here's the real difficulty that we can have with providence. It's also the difficulty we can have in in talking to others who might not be believers about God's providence. And this is it. This is, this is the kicker with this. We humans typically cannot see God's providence at work except in retrospect. Okay? 
We love to say that hindsight is 2020, right? And it is. I mean, you think of Joseph, right? When Joseph was being stuffed into that cistern by his brothers, when he was being sold into slavery, uh, he was even thrown into jail for a couple of years. At that point, or those points in his life, I bet it was awfully hard for Joseph to see God's providence working in his life. But after he made it through that, after he made it to the palace, and he used his gifts to save thousands of people from starvation, then Joseph was able to look back and say, aha, aha, I see God's hand at work in all of us, right? That's providence. You know, as we lived through a pandemic, last year in 2020 and we experienced some really uh, unhealthy unhappy things like isolation and fear and scarcity and so many difficult emotions at that point maybe i don't know last summer maybe it was difficult to see god's hand at work but now that we're in 2021 and we can look back on that year now, it is, it is really part of our responsibility as Christians to point out where we can see God's hand guiding us. I mean, did it bring families closer together? Right? Did, it, did it make us appreciate one another more and the ability to be one-on-one -on -one with one another? Did it help us to appreciate the small things in as a church, did it guide us into the partnership that we have with Beaver Falls where we can do fun activities with one another? And did it lead us to reach out in things like social media, like Ed is filming right now, right? To, to, to film our service and send it out to people who would never have seen our service before. Of course, the pandemic is not over yet, and I'm not saying that it is. And of course, 2021 will present even more challenges to us as we face people still coming down with COVID, and people fighting over masks and vaccines and all of that. But we need to trust in God enough to know that his providential hand is still at work bringing good out of the chaos that is still here in 2021. The Apostle Paul says, We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purposes. All things working together for good. That's Paul's language. Paul's language to describe Providence. The biblical understanding of providence holds that God is always at work, guiding and moving the world and everything in it towards his goals. Namely, God's establishment of God's full reign on earth, God's reign of peace and justice for all. And no matter what we silly humans decide to do, or not to, God will not stop in moving, moving his plan forward. Now, in our women's Bible study this week, we saw, we watch every week a little snippet, a video snippet, and this week, Angie Smith, who is on our video, she said something that really aligns very well with this. She said, we are called as Christians to trust in God even when our present circumstances look bleak. Right? Even when we look around ourselves and we don't see any reason to trust God, we still have to trust God. Right? Trusting in God's goodness, trusting that God will provide for us. That's another way of saying that God's providence is always at work in our lives. Friends, believing this, we as the church, we need to press forward with hope and with optimism, no matter what the present circumstances, knowing that we are all 
in God's hands. We need to continue to live out the instructions of Jesus when he told us to love our neighbors and pray for our enemies. We need to listen continually to the prophets, like the prophet Micah when he said, Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. We need to look beyond our present sufferings and difficulties and to understand that God's providential care includes us, both now and forevermore. What is God really like, my friends? Well, God is providential. Praise be to God. Amen.